Oh, man, I had you scheduled for 11, but, man, I'm ready to rock if you are. Oh, uh, that's fine. I, my instructions here to say it's at 11 o'clock, but I'm supposed to call a few minutes in advance. So <laughs> this is me calling a few minutes in advance. <laughs> I love that because, you know, it's those that call 10 minutes where we should have started from. It's like, oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're only my second podcast with the new book, so I'm still a little nervous. So I make sure I'm on time. Nervous is OK, because I, I believe that means you care. When somebody tells me that, especially when it comes to broadcasting students, they say, I'm so nervous. Nervous. I know you are. That means you care. Yeah, and I do. I really do. And thank you for this. I truly appreciate the opportunity. Well, it, every, it's everything that I've always wanted to do with the podcast, View from the Writing Instrument. I've always believed that we have all these books, but we don't get to hear the authors. We don't get to hear your inflection, your 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 reasons for bringing a story together. For instance, like Rain Breaks No Bones is the fourth of, of this trilogy and the last. And and for readers that have been with you all the way, it's like, wait, no, this can't end. you you got to give us something else, Barbara. <laughs> well, it's the third, and I am working on a fourth, but it has nothing to do with the trilogy, so it's a brand new book. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I felt like it took three books to tell this story, so I hope the reader agrees. Well, how do you know how to continue the story? That, that's always been a big mystery to me in, in the way that you, did, did you sit down and say, well, this is going to be a trilogy, or did you just keep writing and writing and writing and decided, okay, this, and the thing about it is listeners need to know, they, they, they're standalone books, even though they are connected. That they're still standalone books. Correct. Correct. They are. And uh, no, I had no idea it was going to be a trilogy. I wrote the first book, Sing in the Morning, Cry at yep. Night, when I was a student at Wilkes University in their creative writing program, their graduate MFA program. And at Wilkes, what they do is they send your work out to an outside reader who's in the industry. And mine happened to be an agent. In the end, she turned out to be my agent, Chris Tomasino. <laughs> She's lovely. But at the time, she read my uh, early draft and she said, if someone picks this up, they're going to expect you to write at least two more books in the same genre or turn it into a trilogy and we talked about it and I thought I think these characters have more to say mm -hmm. but I didn't want it to be okay book one ends and then the next day I decided to separate the books each by about 20 years so the first oh. one is 1913 the second one is the 1930s and then my new book rain breaks no bones is 1955 so we can now see the uh ramifications on 50 year old violet of an event that happened when she was a little girl yeah i, I love the way that you covered that because the, you know we we think sometimes out of sight out of mind no it's still living inside and you kind of prove that Exactly. Oh, it's always living inside. And and as a writer, I don't know if other writers do this, but I just have to get quiet and listen to that because truly my characters tell the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that, you know, all I do is I, I, I go to the paper because I, I, I'm a hand writer. I, I don't do it on, onto the computer. Uh, so I, I have to put it on the page first. But to me, it's not me that's writing. It's that page, which was once a tree, which was once a seed. Oh, I love that. I love that image. I, it's funny. I compose on the computer nowadays, but I still revise by hand. Yeah. So I sharpen those pencils. I spread everything out on a big table and I sit there and revise by hand. So there's something about that pen to paper, pencil to paper that, that really does make a difference. How do you keep that perfectionist in line then? Because I mean, if you're doing it with that pencil, that means you can erase it. Julia Cameron was always about that. Oh, don't use a pencil. You can easily erase things. Yeah. You know, I hear all of that advice and it's great advice. And if I could listen to it, I would probably be better off. Um, I don't try to rein in the perfectionist. I, I'm a relatively slow writer because I write and revise and write and revise. And on any given day, I might walk away with a paragraph, but it's a damn good paragraph because I have worked and worked and yep. reworked it. So, you know, you're going to put the work in up front or at the other end, either way. So when you're working those paragraphs, is is that the source next to you? I'm sorry. Is that the source? Yeah. Is the no? Is the the, the whoever invented oh, this word? Yeah. <laughs> That's a crazy <laughs> word. Whoever invented it, the source. <laughs> exactly. The Greeks, I think. Uh, yes. Um, I, I I have an electronic one. I mean, I have yeah. it on my phone, but the the source is there constantly. And I actually the the source sort of inspires some of my images because uh, I come up with a better word, and then it takes me to a different word yeah. and a whole different group 
up and and it just my imagination goes wild. Wow. Now, it takes place in Scranton. I I had no yes. idea that all of this stuff with the miners and the ev- evangelists and and the vaudevillians and and the gangsters were there. I mean, it's like, what? Wait, this sounds like Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Scranton has such a rich history. I'm from Scranton, born and raised, recently moved back here, and I absolutely love it. But the mining industry was really huge here. In fact, the nation sort of depended on us. At one point when the miners got uh, went on strike, the president of the United States got involved. This is how important we were. Also, our proximity to New York, when in, in the times of vaudeville, we were one of the early stops so people could try their acts out here. Wow. So there was all kinds of life happening in Scranton. And you had the wealthy, you know, had you had the coal barons who were benefiting, and then you had the miners who were really uh, suffering. You know, they were working 12 hours a day, six hours a week. And in my first book, I look at the mining industry And then by the time I get to 1955 for the third book, Rain Breaks No Bones, the mining industry was in decline. Mm -hmm. So you almost I I can I consider Scranton to be a character because we can also see the sort of the dramatic arc of the city if you know as you read the books. Wow. And the way that you you bring in Violet, especially with the situation that she when at the age of 50, she wishes that her younger sister were there because she w- it would help her with her own daughter who's got secrets. So I mean it's I like the way that you tie things together like that. Right. And and actually in the first book and I'm not giving anything away because you know this in every book, Violet's sister Daisy passes away. Yep, yep. It's a tragic accident, and that's very loosely based on a family story. In my own life, my great aunt wow. Pearl, uh, on the day she was baptized, it was the 4th of July, her dress caught on fire when they were playing with sparklers, and she survived for three days, and she sang hymns, and the story was that everybody in Scranton came to view the body of the little girl who sang hymns. So I grew up with that story. Story. And as tragic as it was for my Aunt Pearl, I always wondered about my Aunt Janet, who was in the yard with her, because she didn't have a very happy life. So, uh, for example, my Aunt Janet was married four times to the same two men. <laughs> so she she had some, you know, a couple of issues there. And and so I used her as my inspiration for Violet. And um, what, I, what I tried to show is that some kind of traumatic event like that, a family tragedy, affects everyone. Every generation. Yeah. So it's still affecting Violet in Rain Breaks No Bones as a 50 year old woman. She's still wishing she had her sister there. Wow, wow. And see, that, that's like a reflection for every one of us of our own families. We all sit there and we, we want to know what happened and what could we have done or what can I do even today? Exactly. And and even in my family, it's funny. I've had conversations with my, my cousins. Now, we're two or three generations removed from the accident, and yet we're all still afraid of sparklers. We're all still probably too careful with the children that are who are in our care, that sort of thing. So it's just that idea of, you know, we're still trying to make sense of, we're still trying to um, deal with that trauma, and we weren't even alive when it happened. So in your in your writing skills and dreams and ambitions, how did the character of Johnny come into being a musician? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Johnny, in my head, I just <laughs> had this idea that Daisy was going to be interested in a piano player. Um, there's a there's a Tom Thumb piano in my first book, and that piano shows back up in the third book. And so I needed somebody to play that piano. And I think it probably came from the inspiration of that instrument. Mm. But then also, uh, Scranton, although we had, a, you know, and still have a healthy African-American population, uh, Scranton in those days was predominantly white. And I knew I wanted to um, I wanted their world to get bigger with each book. And so part of it was 1955, the civil rights movement is heating up. And I wanted to reflect that in the book. And so Johnny is from out of town and he's a black character Mm -hmm. who uh, comes to town and sees Scranton through those eyes and then. Daisy, who's a white character, they they have a relationship. Uh, she's a dancer. He's a musician. So it's a natural fit. But I was also able to look at um, 
you know, just what was happening in the world. And I have to say, I have a character in the book. He's the band leader, um, Ferdy Bastoki. He's a real person. <laughs> and Ferdy Bastoki in real life broke the color barrier when he had African-American musicians in his band. I interviewed some some local musicians and got the backstories. So when I had that happen for Johnny in Scranton, that's based on a real story. Wow. You know, the, the way that you bring reality into a storyline and that, that that fascinates me because you're right there, there's always a reason and a purpose especially when you're talking about that piano and all of a sudden it shows up in book number three because now if, if somebody starts at book number one they can see the first piano as being oh she planted an easter egg in this story oh something's gonna happen it makes me want to get deeper into those paragraphs yeah, and what's funny is I really didn't plant the Easter egg. I yeah. mean, I've done a little bit of that since, but I didn't know I was writing a trilogy. I do, I believe there's a, you know, a, a bigger force. You can call it God. You can call it the muse, whatever you want to call it. Um, somehow what I set up in book one eventually ended up in Rain Breaks No Bones. And again, you can read them separately. There's no need to read them in order. But if you're reading book three, you see this great piano. If you read book one, you know where the piano came from. So it's that sort of thing. The energy of your writing. I, I live in a forest and I believe that there's something that's out there in that forest that is controlling my my dream of, of, of writing and the podcasting and everything like that. Do you believe in the same kind of thing? Are trees talking to you or some sort of spirit i wouldn't say trees so much i mean i do like to get out in nature don't take me wrong but i have just learned that there is a voice in my head and there's something bigger than i understand and i'm okay with not understanding it i just say thank you i yep. listen yep. i had a character in the new book the character of ruth and i'll tell you what she kept coming to me and telling me this story she's the prologue it's how the book opens mm -hmm. and and i kept saying listen this is a great story but it doesn't belong in this book i'll get back to you <laughs> and she wouldn't let go and and honestly it sort of delayed the book because i wasn't listening and then maybe i don't know six eight months into it all of a sudden i stopped i listened i did some meditating some free writing and it came to me i knew exactly this was as much as much her story as it was everybody else's so so you have to listen to whatever that force is. Yeah. I just hear it in my head. <laughs> do you have do you set up some rules? And I, I do do that in the in the way that it's like, okay, you can stay here, you you can do what you need to do so that we can move forward, but you cannot do anything in the shape of being bad. And if you do, out, you're gone. Um, I don't really set rules that way. I don't I don't think. Uh, I will say just a personal rule. If I'm using a real person, like for example, Ferdy Bastoki, I like to pepper the books with with real events that were going on in real people. Mm -hmm. I won't turn those people into bad characters. You know, I mean, he was a good man. I'm sure he lived a good life. And so I wouldn't do that to somebody who's living. Um, I change a lot of names so that people don't think that you know, when I when I get into some of the darker forces that I'm talking about their families. So that is a rule for me. I totally understand that because one of my books deals with uh, my younger years as in, in high school and I and I didn't change names and, and Tony to this day is still pissed off at me. I mean <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will say I have this group. I used to be a teacher. I taught high school English for thirty one and a half years. And so in the second book it opens at the Good Shepherd Infant Asylum for Wayward girls and the girls are pregnant and I named all the girls after my teacher friends but I did get their permission so so they're all pregnant teenagers in the second in all waiting is long <laughs> so that was fun where can people go to find out more about what you're doing and to get into all of these books oh thank you uh, my website is a great place to start it's Barbara J Taylor dot com and if you go to barbarajtaylor.com, you can also find, I have a Facebook author page, Barbara J. Taylor author. I'm on Instagram by the same handle. And I just go into the inspiration for the books and give you some backstory. So it's a great place to start, barbarajtaylor.com. And once again, that's every bit the reason why I started the View from the Writing Instrument, because I mean, we don't know what you went through in order to put a book together or how much research went into it. And, the, and to me, all of these great novels are still, they're written, but they're underneath people's beds or in the attic. And my goal is to get people to wake up and get it out there. 
Oh, that's such a great goal. I love that. I appreciate that as a writer. So thank you. Well, you've got to come back to this show anytime in the future. You've got that other book that's going to be coming. So I expect to hear from you. Ah, thank you so much. And I truly appreciate this. I just, I love what you're doing. So thank you so much. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you. You as well. I love that. If I were still teaching, I'd say the same thing to my students. Have a great day.